you tell us what is the meaning of life? We've been asking everybody lately. The meaning of life? God. To start with a simple question like that. If I knew that, I should write a book about it. The meaning of life, I think, is, uh, is quite clearly 42. We are now in London. What do you think of the rock scene in London, for example, this year? Is um, there anything particularly revolutionary going on, or is it always the same faces? Well, it has been. I mean, it has been for a while, actually, and, and that's why I've sort of really lost interest in, in, in the what's going on in England a bit. I mean, there seems to be a lot of exciting stuff happening in Europe. I mean, like um, uh, I mean, my solo band, I mean, obviously we used an Italian drummer, and now we're going out on the road with a German drummer. And uh, a lot of musicians coming from Europe who are, who are really talented. And um, I think that's very refreshing, you know, to kind of break the... Uh, you know, break the stranglehold that the that, that, that British people thought they had on rock music. Because I think it'll probably make it better for us. Because it'll make... I think England, we, sometimes we suffer from being a bit... a um, uh, bit like the English football team. You know, we think we're better than we really are. <laughs> Do me last night. Yeah, I was embarrassing, wasn't it? I mean, I was embarrassed to be English. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I don't even follow football much. I don't know much about football. But uh, I know a terrible, terrible game when I see one, and, and it was just, you know, it's the first football match I've watched in four years, and I don't think I watch I another one. And yeah, exactly. I was not only was it embarrassing, it was boring. How about Scotland, Costa Rica? I didn't see the game, so I don't know. It's even more bar embarrassing. Was it really? Yeah. I, I didn't see that one. I saw a couple of goals from uh, the Brazilians and the West Germans and the Italians, and it's a different. They're, they're, they're playing football. I mean, I don't know what to, I don't know what was going on last night, but it wasn't it wasn't a game of football. It was very odd. Um, but anyway, um, what were we talking about? About European musicians coming to London and giving their influence influences. And we somehow got on the football. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, England. I mean, um, I always think of England as like the, the I think the real heyday of England was was when we had those great um, bands of the early 70s. You know, Free, Bad Company, Cream, Led Zeppelin, Jethro Tull, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Jesus, I mean, you know. Um, and then after that, then we, you know, then we had punk, and um, even when we had punk, you know, we had the Boomtown Rats, and there was the Clash and the Stranglers, and those bands all went out. And then you had like the Def Leppards and Iron Maidens. But, since then, um, I don't know. Things, other people seem to have taken our, taken the, the ideas, and you know, and adapted them very well. And so now you've got bands like sort of Faith No More, and you've got bands like um, Kings X and Soundgarden and Anthrax and people that are coming over with uh, real, you know, real attitude bands that are coming over and, 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 and good musically as well. I mean, Anthrax are excellent musically. And coming over and... Uh, and yet you seem to have all these English kids getting, you know, like dressed up in all the glam gear and everything and trying to make out like there's something in Hollywood, which is awful. Because um, it's not... I mean, culturally, it's not what England's about at all. I mean, England's about, you know, it's a bit dirty and, you know, we drink our beer warm and... Um, I think we're much better at, as it were, the Iron Maiden approach, which is like the, you know, whatever the music is, the, the more earthy, basic approach to things. And I think probably the fact that other bands are coming in and are doing very well um, will probably slap us around the head a bit, and maybe the rock scene will get a bit more interesting. And there's a bit of interest. I mean, bands like Thunder and people like that are doing well, which I think is good. How about now this solo project of yours? Could you tell us a little bit of the process of making of the album? Yeah. Um, what were the highlights and the worst moments of, of the recording of this album? The worst moment, I think, uh, the worst moments, uh, worst moment was the fear uh, that all the songs were going to be rubbish. And, uh, yeah, that was the worst moment. But you got rid of it? No. No, not yet. No, not until the day the album was released and people liked it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, I believed in the songs, um, but there's still the fear that other people don't, because <laughs> you know they just some people just don't, and so um, we ended up with uh, well, we ended up with all the young dudes on there partly for that reason because we thought, well, we'll put a cover on there. It's a really good cover, I think, of that song. How about the book? You have also released the book. Yeah, well, the book, um, the book again, I wrote four years ago on a Nine Maiden tour, mainly to make people laugh, and it worked. They all smiled. Is it sort of a lock book? Fun. Does it tell about your real experiences or just imagination? No, it's a. You know, I haven't read the book, have you? No, no, it's yet. utterly disgusting. <laughs> It's completely filthy, and two MPs tried to ban it because they said it was offensive to women. Oh. They were right. It is offensive to women. It's also offensive to men as well. In fact, it's offensive to just about everybody. But then, most humour is. Is there anything you don't do? Is there anything I don't do? Yes. I don't take strange drugs. I don't need to. I do enough insane things already. How about if you could change one thing in rock business, what would it be? Only one. If I could change one thing, what would it be? I'd, um... I know what I'd do. Actually, I think it would be quite good, actually, if they did this for everything, if they did it for, for everything. I think if they... If you, I think they should have a, I think they should have a bullshit detector, on all um, all newspapers, televisions, and uh, records. Sort of like imposed by God. So every time somebody said something that was like, Beep. not certainly from the heart, it just went bullshit like that. <laughs> How about the Rolling Stones? We've been asking everybody what they think of them because they are. Well, they haven't been away, but they, in in a way, they have gone, come back mm. this year. They always do when they're short of cash. Mm. Like the Who. Yeah. Have I they mean, ever influenced you? Everybody says that Keith Richards is their big idol of all time. Why? Not mine. Why? I mean, I admire the way that, you know, he was a drug addict and he managed to sort himself out, but lots of people do that. Not just Keith Richards, mm. um, and he's got a you know he's got an interesting guitar style you know kind of based on like a Chuck Berry sort of thing, and but um, no, they've never been a really big, never been a really big influence in my life. The Rolling Stones. Mm. How about your band? Are there any Stones freaks? No, mm. don't think so. Not particularly. I mean, you register, you know, like, oh yeah, the Rolling Stones, yeah, you know, quite good. You know, did one or two good singles and stuff like that. But I'm not like a r complete, like, r lunatic about the Stones. Are you going to see them at Wembley? No. Not at all? I've never seen the Rolling Stones. I feel I should go and see the Rolling Stones, but I can't be bothered. I mean, it's just like, hello, <laughs> it's the Rolling Stones, it's Mick Jagger, you know. Um, if you want to go and see the Rolling Stones, if you want to go and see somebody like that, I mean, somebody I really would like to go and see is somebody like, say, uh, I don't know, Iggy Pop or something like that. So if you want to see what Mick Jagger should be like, go and see Iggy Pop. How about your voice? Do you? I heard that you sometimes do, just before we started this interview. How do you open up your voice? Do you do warm-ups and, like, something to make the rest of the band shout, shut up? Before the gig or? No, I try and avoid that. It puts everybody off. Um, I used to. Take off, lessons uh, or something? Like no, I never took lessons. Mm. No. Um, when I first started off, I used to, uh, you know, sort of like in the sh in, in go and nip, in, nip into the showers before the show and do my warm ups. And never worked. I'd still go on stage and couldn't hear myself and get, go into a blind panic and like, oh, what's going on? So now all I do is, and now all I do is I just sort of think, oh, well, let's just go on and there's the audience and there's the, the PA and, and let's just sing. 
singing is a the the act of performing is an outward going thing, right? Um, and if you've got an audience, you walk on stage and it, you do everything. It's for them, you know. So if you're sat in a, a little room beforehand, going me 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 me, and you walk out on stage, the first thing you're thinking about is me like that, not them. And so I find it I'm in a much better frame of mind if I go out and I'm looking at the audience, thinking about them, and going, you know, bush. Because then if the sound is bad or whatever, it doesn't matter. You ignore it. You ignore the sound because. You, you're singing it for the audience. It might it, it might sound crap on stage, but it might sound great out there. And so, you always give the audience the benefit. How about the song. How about the singer's life on tours? Is it sort of a nightmare? You can't go to a smoky room, not to a noisy place, to avoid shouting, or do you just yes. let it be? Yes, all the all of the above, except sometimes you don't. You know, because I mean, I, I mean, I admire people that can just like lock themselves in, in their rooms and. Um, well, no, I don't admire them. I think they're bloody lunatics, actually. Because um, I don't see how you can, I don't see how you can be in a, in a, um, uh, a job that involves people all the time. Because that's what a performer is: is involved with people, especially something like being in a heavy rock group or something. I don't see how you can be involved with people and entertain people and sing songs about people and, and, and without ever meeting any. And when you're on the road, the worst thing is that you can get totally isolated from the rest of uh, the rest of the world. And um, one of the ways to really help that isolation along is just like locking yourself in a room before the show and and everything. I like to try and I like a, a bit of time to get my concentration together, perhaps. And if my voice, if there's something, you know, like if my voice is sore, or if um, you know, if it's sick, or if I've got a little throat infection, or a cold, or flu, it's different. You're going away to recover, to rest. That's fine. But just to do it every day is like a matter of routine. You know, sometimes I've done the best performances of, of my life with a terrible hangover. How about your future plans? What will you be doing, for example, 10 years from this moment on? Do you have plans like that? No. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> not at all, not no. A, not a book full of dreams. Oh, I've got a book full of dreams. Mm -hmm. Several what books is full a of big dreams. Dream? Oh, astronaut, train driver, oh. like to sort of like buy a submarine, <laughs> um, uh, learn to fly, have my own railway station, parachute. have my own railway. No, I don't want a parachute. Uh, micro light, um, uh, do another few solo albums, make a movie, write another couple of books, have some children, um, keep the same wife. Um, more Iron Maiden albums, maybe do a movie with Iron Maiden, maybe direct and produce one or two videos. Uh, perhaps even get into a little bit of production in the studio. Do you think that's long enough? I think they're 20 years. So there isn't a one big dream. You want to do no. it all. You want it all, and you want it now. I just don't, no, just no. I don't want it all now. You know, I mean, there's all these different things you can do that are fun, and I just view it as though it's it's enjoyable. I enjoy it. I enjoy entertaining people. It's hard work, and yes, and you, you can't, can't moan about it. If you have a bit of a talent for it, can you tell us what has been the be, the worst and the best gig of your lives thus far? Or do you rather forget the bad ones? The worst gig. And of what my life. what has happened? Maybe a power cut or something. An electric an electric shock or. Hopefully not. No, you know the worst the worst gigs. The worst gigs are always the ones where nothing happens. See, a power cut and stuff like that, it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. The power goes off, it goes dark, it comes back on again, everybody's like, wow, great, it turns into a party. Mm -hmm. It's no problem, you know. The worst ones 
I wear somebody sits there and they just go all night. Nobody does anything. And at the end of the show they collapse blindly. And then just sit there like that. Those are the worst ones. Um, the best one. The best ones is where everybody does everything from the word go. And they listen. What I like is the ones where you, you get totally in tune with the audience. Where when you're going nuts, they're going nuts. Or when you're being quiet and trying to be really intense, mm. they're watching. And that's what I like. And something to everyone in Finland. Hello, Finland. If I'd known you were going to make this single number seven, I'd have been over there on this little tour that we're doing at the moment. But as it is, I would dearly love to come over there and play some stuff for you from the solo band. And if we can, in August, um, fingers crossed, if we can squeeze a day off from uh, Iron Maiden rehearsals, maybe we'll get on the plane and come over and just do a one-off show. I'd really like to have to talk to my manager about it. But anyway, in the meantime, we'll, we'll see you with Iron Maiden towards the end of uh, this year. But thanks very much for the single. We'll see you around. This is a guitarist special, in a way. Could you tell us, why did you choose your instruments? Well, um, well, actually, the first instrument I had was from Woolworths, which is like a, a clothing store that sold very cheap guitars. But now we use Fender Strats. Well, I use kind of Strats, um, Jackson Strats, you know. And you haven't used the Strats, Strats, right? yeah, just Strats. Mm. Fender Stratocasters, what very old ones. Why do you think you chose guitars, not drums or um, singing or...? Because I can't sing. I wanted to <laughs> sing like Ian Gillan and I couldn't, so I tried to play guitar instead, like Davey Murray. Well, yeah, I tried <laughs> to play like Yannick after seeing him in Gillan. <laughs> 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 but I think, well, I, stayed, I heard Hendrix on the radio and I heard this sound and I wondered what it was, so I found out it was a guitar and uh, I decided to, to you know, pursue that. Instead, I mean, like drummers, I guess they bang things all the time, right, you know, and... Uh, Head bang? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, bang well, hand tables, hand yeah. yeah. But I just think, it, it's good in, I think in the guitar you can, it, you have a very good chance to express yourself and it feels good to play, you know. What was the most difficult part of playing in the beginning? Uh, your fingers hurt a lot. I still do, in fact. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, just getting your fingers to stop hurting when you hit the F chord and hold that bar across. You know, still can't get. do it That's after right, all yeah. these years. But yeah. when I started, I got one of these little guitars, a bit like David, but I got one from uh, a place called Bruce Moore's, like, and the strings are about this high off the fretboard. And you, to actually press, you know, to press them down, you need, you need something like a G clamp to clamp them down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I tried to play it a few years ago, and I still can't play it. It was so hard to play it, it was un unbelievable. And it used to hurt your hands. How yeah. about the most difficult part for yeah, well you? Yeah, in fact, I, I thought learned, once I'd learned bar chords, um, that was, it was all over, because um, no power driver from status quo, that was a very big influence for me. And so when I learned to do that 12 bar and get the little finger going, I was quite happy, actually, because there's a lot of stuff you could play, like rock and roll standards, like Johnny Be Good and Roll Over Beethoven, and there was all the same 12 bars, but different keys. So... I mean, it's obviously, it's very difficult, and I used to spend, like, eight hours a day. And uh, when I worked, so I used to rush home lunchtime and practice for an hour and then go back to work. And it's, you know, you just have to spend a lot of time. And, but even now, I mean, it still hurts. <laughs> I have to lift weights now, you know. Like, Rudolf yeah. Schenke told us that the first song he ever learned to play was Hippie Hippie Shake. How about you? Oh, God. Um, you know, I, I think one of the first ones was, uh, I th you know, you know, remember the song called One Qualamero? I think it was a, a kind of thing I just used to play on once. Usually it's Smoke on the Water. Um, no, it wasn't actually with oh. me. It was, I think it was before Smoke on the Water uh. was written. <laughs> <laughs> 71, that must be. Yeah, I was just in the purple then, yeah. yeah um, oh, God, I think it was probably, I think it was something from T-Rex, actually. I think it was, like, Time and the Source Rex. He used to do a lot of acoustic stuff. Deborah. And it was something, yeah, yeah like, Deborah, like Deborah. Deborah. Yeah. That was the first sort of thing, you know. Cause and I was then there was, uh, which is after Ride a White Swan. Hot Love. Hot Love, Hot love yeah. yeah. Everybody learned that one. Yeah. But mainly, you know, you'd buy, like, books. In fact, a lot of Beatles stuff, 
there was a big thick Beatles book out that had all and the chords. And it still is. Yeah. <laughs> and stuff. and I, my sister used to listen to the Beatles all the time, so that was always playing in the house. And I was familiar with the songs, so I used to sit down and try and fumble my way through these And the other thing songs, that a lot of people know. do is the, uh, the shadows, the old shadows numbers, the old patch yeah, and all those. Or yeah. not, I no, think the instrumental. Yeah the, begin yeah, the instrumental stuff. Hank Everyone Martin. used to start with that, you know. Mm. How about what do you think on stage? Do you concentrate on the playing or do you just let your thoughts flow all over? Um, yeah, I'd like to just not think about anything. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, but I don't think about what I'm going to be playing. What the next play, what, no, what the next some, song is Sometimes I have to look at, the, you know, what song's next, but I think uh, the beginning of the tour, you have to sort of, you're concentrating more, because you're playing new songs and you're on stage, everything's new again. So you concentrate on playing, and after, it takes a couple of weeks, you can forget about playing and you can just go out and really just have fun and just try and feel, you sort of feel free to do what you like, you know. You the music with I'm in, it's very intricate and it's got to lock in, you know, the guitars have to lock in together and there's a, there's a kind of, uh, I don't know, sort of classical type of thing about it, it's got to be tight, you know, between me and Dave, so there's that, we've got to kind of make sure that's right, but apart from that, it's like Dave, so we just have fun. Mm. Yeah, because some of the melodies are <coughs> quite complicated, really, if you listen to them t and to play there. So sometimes you may be thinking ahead, like this bit's coming up now, and you kind of... There's some parts of the songs you have to concentrate on just because they're difficult, you know. And But mainly you can just, you can just play away and, and uh, try not to fall over, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, that, that happens anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> How about the best and the worst moment of your career as this far? Um, Has something funny, for oh, example, well, happened? Tour, <coughs> yes, tour, or, or your career? Yeah, um, your career, Dave. My career. It's flashing I before. It's very. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, some of the fun. Well, actually, the once well, it probably wasn't the funniest moment, but I um, we was on stage in in America, and I was. And it was a terrible gig, actually. It was it wasn't the sound was terrible. So at the end, I just smashed my guitar up on stage, and I threw it out in the audience, and it hit this policeman on the head. <laughs> right, and it, mm, good and choice. It, and it, yeah, well, it knocked him out. It knocked him out. So they carried him backstage, you know. And um, and he was going to actually sue me, I think. He was thinking of suing me or something. And then our tour manager gave him. He gave him a couple of hundred dollars and said, we said, sorry and everything. A couple of and hundred tickets. You know, yeah. And what was really funny, that his name, his surname was Murray. His, he had that the helped. same surname. So there was something that probably was meant to be. Intuition. Meant, yeah, that was meant to hit him on the head. So that was probably like could, one of the most sort of more disasters that happened, you know. But I had a good fun smashing the guitar up. <laughs> you know. How about you? The uh -huh. highlight of your career this far? Yeah, I suppose playing with Maiden's a mm. highlight. I, I'm, I'm really getting off on playing with the boys, it's great. Um, I suppose disappointment was when Gillen split, when Ian had the throat problems. And when I fell over last week, <laughs> I tripped over Dave's lead. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, uh, So, your opinion on Ian Gillen? He was fin in Finland recently. Ian? Yeah, I think he's, he's obviously... Uh, He's a brilliant singer, a great front man. Got a lot of respect for Ian Gillen, you know. Mm. David. Yeah, I've loved um in fact, um I saw Yannick when he played with Gillen, um, you know, in fact I think it was the last concert he may have oh, yeah, done with him at Wembley yeah. and I thought it was brilliant. I mean, I was thinking, Crikey, I'm witness this is the last gig this band's ever gonna play and I thought they were great, you know, I mean mm. I really enjoy them so Say so some things are, I mean, are meant to happen. You know. there, there's, uh, there's three great singers, as far as I'm concerned, and you know, from from very they're very original singers. And one was Paul Rogers, I think the other was Robert Plant, and and you know, the obvious other choice is Ian Gillan from, mm. from you know those decades ago. Innovators, all three of them. People can they get a bit frightened that we're so like we're we're actually we believe in what we're doing and we feel strongly about it and, it and it's for real and a lot of people can't handle that because everything is sort of genuine and, and our attitude is there we've come out and play music mm. and we you know and we hit 
in the face. A lot of people have to hide behind things. They've got things to hide behind, little shields and stuff. And and because we actually come out, a lot of people get a bit frightened about that. I think. But know? I mean, before I joined the band, I mean, just to agree with, with what they've mm. said, is that the, the thing about I made them was that there was they never compromised in the music they were doing. It was always a straight, direct route, and there's a lot of integrity about the band and and. That, that attitude again, that that's what they're going to do, and they're not going to release a commercial single just to sell a million more records or whatever. You know, the, 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 there isn't that kind of record company pressure. Mid not how many records they're going to sell, but they're not going to change in order to sell more. You know, and there's that kind of honesty and integrity that I, I think that the kids who come to see the band get off on. You know, it, it's and even us elderly women. Uh, yeah, I think you know, <laughs> I, I did. You know, I've been I'm elderly. thirty. I hear. Oh, <laughs> cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, uh, that's yeah. what I felt about the band before I was in it. I mean, I've been watching them for 10 years and I've known David for a long time. And just honesty and integrity, and, you know, what more can you ask mm. for? Andy Summers told us in this show that he got lost with all the effects he bought when he was we playing the guitar. Away. What do you think of <laughs> using the effects? as a guitar player, are they necessary, for example, for you? We don't really use any. Mm, uh, no. Synthesizers and stuff like that. His yeah. house was full of them and then he just... I yeah. think he's that kind of player and the kind of music he was doing yeah. probably warranted that. And I've got nothing against effect, but I just like to hear you, the guitar player, playing with what he's got and amplifying a guitar. Mm -hmm. You know, there's various things like a graphic or whatever you need to boost certain sounds, but... Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of effects that I use, a couple, you know a couple of like a phase or a flanger, sort of an an echo, you know, but that's about it really. It goes pretty much straight into the amp because uh, sometimes you can use effects to create different moods if you like, and maybe add a bit of colour or something, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, here great. and there. That's yeah, if it complements the music, you know, um, like in some Maiden songs, you know, you're, you're more likely to hear a little bit of synth here and there, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, some acoustic stuff and I mean we've, we've actually this in the songs you know there's very like clean guitars heavy guitars synths I mean there's all there's a bit that um, um, that's sort of like the only plays like a cello sort of effect right but it's done on the on the you know that bit of no fair for the dying there's sort of like a oh, cello -y yeah. type of um, yeah. thing you know that's just the guitar with dampening the strings yeah in your so you yeah. can create you can make things work just by playing Without effects as well, if you like. You I know, used to go and watch Rory Gallagher years ago, you know, and he never had any effects. In fact, he had a very, very old guitar and a very old amplifier. And I was always amazed at the sounds that he got out of it, you know. Mm, just just by it. using his hands and, you know, playing with the pick different ways. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, I think that's great. But that's not get, I, I'm not knocking effects because I like Jeff Beck as well. And he tends Frank to Zabba has a. Yeah, you know, it's great, but, mm. you know, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. And I think mm. as long as it doesn't get in the way of the sound that's coming out and, and it makes it sound better, that's great. But if it sound, starts to make it sound worse, then, you yeah. know, take them away and get rid of them, dump them. How about guitar playing in general? We had Jeff Healing on this show. What do you think of his style? Yeah. He's great. I mean, He's great. In fact, I saw him a couple of days ago in, um, in Copenhagen. And, oh, he's brilliant. I mean, he was up playing. I love that type of um, music. It's like, um, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan meets Jimi Hendrix type of, you know, blues, you know. And uh, I think it's very exciting, and his approach is so different as well, you know. And I think he plays, he's got a lot of feel, a lot of soul, because maybe it's just because of the way he is, you know. But I think he's very, very, very talented, you know. I think he's a one-off. I, I think that kind of style of guitar playing, it's very much his style. And I don't know whether there's going to be a lot of people coming out playing that way. I'm not saying there isn't, but I think mm. he's very much got it pinned down to what, to what he's doing. Mm. He's very good. He plays with a lot of soul, you know. I think he's a very good guitar player. Yeah, I think individuality, and he sounds, if you put on the radio, you can hear it, and it sounds like Jeff Healy. You can tell it straight away, you know. How about John Mayall? He's also on this show. He was here in the summertime. Oh, John Mayall, yeah, the blues. you ever? The blues breakers. Yeah, I used to listen to the blues breakers with Eric Clapton. Mm. But, I mean, li later on, I was just in... I, I was mainly brought up with Purple and Zeppelin, but... I mean, I was aware of the blues breakers, yeah. Mm. And Alexis Corner and a few of the other people like that. Mm. Yeah, I love a lot of the old blues guys. Yeah. You know, like B.B. King and Freddie King. Robbie Cannon's very good as well. Yeah. 
Because a, a lot of them say more, the, the blues guys, they can say more with just a couple of notes than... than um, Even with one note, yeah. like Gary Clapton well, that's said, yeah, you that's have to right. say it with <coughs> one note. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. People yeah. like Paul Kozov, who I know Dave really likes, and, mm. and I like because he used to be with Free, and uh, he's a great guitar player. He was a beautiful player. You know, he could, he could say everything with two or three notes. Well, a lot of people now tend to go to this kind of guitar school in America and come out playing about 50 million notes to every minute, you know. And it's not really that clever. That. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you think of this faster and faster the, the video, style? The video, like, Plan a Day course, you know, where uh, I've seen a couple of them. It's first, well, first you put your makeup on, then you <laughs> put hairspray on. And then, right, and, and then another, yeah, and all that, and then you put all the gear on, and then you pick up the guitar. You know, it's it's funny because they've got the approach is so narrow. It's American, it's, isn't it? It's, it's a very kind of American, yeah, lot LA approach, very cabaret. So yeah. you're well, a I'm very kind of British band. Yeah, yeah, yeah very I think English. you can say that. Yeah. yeah. But about the fast guitar players, yeah. just getting back to that, is uh, sometimes you tend to feel that uh, they're playing with a lack of feeling, a lack of soul in, in what they're doing. You know. But I, you know, it's fair enough as long as they're happy doing it. That's great. Yeah, some of them are very, very, very. Um, but it's got to be more than just getting from here to be on a guitar as fast as you can. You know, the idea is to, to bring something out of yourself, some some soul or whatever it is that's in there. The way that people like Kosov did and uh, Jeff Beck does. Into what direction do you think electric guitar playing will go in the future? Um, Back to the roots of the 50s and 60s, or? into this faster and faster. Yeah. Everything, isn't yeah, I think there is enough space yeah. for, and I think there'll still be um, bands they don't need still a way be themselves. playing rock. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I think as we get into the future, it's probably going to be even more, far, probably, I don't know how far she can get, but it's probably going to be a bit more mechanical, if you like. Um, but I think there's always room for, there's always going to be bands around that can play the blues and have a good feeling. Right, you know. the task, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of it is, cult is cultural as well. I mean, you're still going to get artists coming out of the ghettos that are going to have something to offer, and they're still going to have to feel. Whereas, just, you know, there is a lot of room for all sorts of music in a way. I think a lot, a lot of that came out with Guns N' Roses, I mean, whether you like them or not. The fact I do. It, well, the fact is that Guns N' Roses are not particularly brilliant guitar players or, or actual musicians, but what they do, they do very well. And, and Slash is the first to admit that he's not the best guitarist in the world. But having said that, you know, I, I'd rather listen to what some of the songs they do than some of the speed sort of freak guitar players. You know, because there's more melody there. And, and it's, it's kind of back to basics, you know, and I, I think that's good.